Bob Brookmeyer mentioned the first rehearsal of the what was to become the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra, but which was initially just known as the Jazz Orchestra. And little me happened to be there too, uh, thanks to, uh, to Thad and Mel. And uh, as Bob said, it was right, it was the A&R studio right upstairs from Jim and Andy's, which was a wonderful musician's hangout on 47th Street? 48, it was 48, right. And Jim and Andy said it uh, was owned by Jim Colavares, who was a great friend of musicians. And uh, Andy, there was no Andy. Andy was Jim's cat. Hmm. <laughs> they also, they, they, aside from being a watering hole, it also featured a small but excellent Italian menu. I can still taste that spaghetti sauce, although it was probably not quite as good as the one at the half now. Uh, anyway, that first rehearsal was really something that uh, indicated that something big was going to happen. And uh, not to, in this case, I'm going to interject myself a little more because uh, I, you know, I did follow the band in its early stages very closely. And I uh, had the pleasure of really writing about it for the first time. I was then New York editor of Downbeat. And that first rehearsal was in December of uh, 65, and in February of 66 came the first Monday night at the Village Vanguard, and Bob was there, of course, and that was sort of a conspiracy. Uh, there was a disc jockey in New York then named Alan Grant, who uh, also had been introduced to the band in its very earliest incarnation. And uh, Alan uh, say enlisted me and we descended on Max Gordon. And Mel, of course, was a great proselytizer as well. So that was what convinced Max, who was a legend, you know, you, you all know who Max, Max Gordon was, I hope. I mean, Max Gordon, one of the legendary club owners in the history of jazz, actually wrote his autobiography, it's called Nights at the Village Vanguard, and uh, uh, Max was ready to experiment, and what happened was that after the second, uh, there were two, the two first nights, uh, two first Mondays were followed by the third. By the third, there was a long line in front of the vanguard, waiting to get in. So word, get in. word spread quickly. And uh, it, it, it just was, was an amazing thing about that band, that you could sense, even at that very first rehearsal, uh, that something special was happening. And uh, I just, uh, I, I hate to, I'm not really quoting myself. I'm just quoting from this early article which was about big bands in New York. And uh, uh, Thad said, it's fantastic. I'm thinking about nothing else but this band. A lot of things had to be done. We had to get men who we felt were compatible musically and personally. So far, it has worked exceptionally well. Everybody has respect for everybody else as musicians and as people. Sometimes I get a little carried away hearing all the spirit coming through the horns. And then Mel said, these are real pros, they want to be here. This is not a fly-by-night thing. And this is a joyful band. We're having a good time on the stand. That's what has been missing on the scene. You know, what was telling them, a lot of the guys, most of them actually, at that time, believe it or not, there was quite a bit of work in New York uh, for jazz musicians in studios. Uh, there was uh, all kinds of commercial stuff going on and so on, but it wasn't very satisfying musically. So that is why you could get, and I just want to, for the record, 
uh, give you that first personnel, which was a trumpet section of Snooky Young. Snooky was playing lead. Snooky's still with us. Snooky was a jazz master in this most recent crop. And, uh, and uh, Jimmy Nottingham, Bill Barry, and Richard Williams. The trombones were Jack Rains, Tom McIntosh, another recent jazz master, Bob Brookmeyer, and Cliff Heather, who was the oldest guy in the band. In the reed section was Jerry Dodgen, Jerome Richardson, Joe Farrell, Eddie Daniels, and Pepper Adams. Uh, there was a guitarist, an acoustic guitarist, who actually had a stance somewhat like Freddie Green, and his name was Sam Herman. When Sam left, there was no replacement for him. He was the only guitarist. He was the happiest of them. Oh? <laughs> and then there was none other than Hank Jones, Dad's brother on piano, and Richard Davis was the bassist. It's quite a lineup. Uh, Anyway, we, we all, I mean, we all know, or we should know what happened from then on. Uh, oh, another thing that, uh, uh, that, that, that Mel said in this interview, which bears quoting, he said, Thad makes quite a front man for the band. He's calling signals like a real quarterback. And that's true because, you know, one thing about this band from the very beginning was made it different from other bands was that uh, if you heard him play uh, a piece once and you heard it the second time, it wasn't the same. You know, most big bands have a kind of set pattern, but with this band, things were happening spontaneously. If, uh, if Dad felt that the soloist really had something to say, he would have him go on. And then, as, 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 as Bob pointed out in this, uh, earlier this afternoon, the, the sections would create backgrounds, you know, with the tr trumpets, trombones, reeds, you know, they'd figure out something to play behind a long solo. And so, you know, things, and, and, and that, another thing that that did, which was new then and fresh, which was something that was happening, sort of in, had been happening in avant-garde jazz, was that the rhythm section would drop out. And that was something really different. So anyway, I mean, these, these, these were really exciting nights at the, at, at the Vanguard, and it really caught on, and it led to the first record being made, and so on.